furries. Every video you watch on YouTube that talks about furries, they either hate them and think that there's some sort of satanic demon that's going to be kidnapping your dog and doing unspeakable horrors to them, or loves them and treats them as if they're a persecuted minority that survived the Holocaust. I don't even know if YouTube's going to let me say that word, but I'm just going to censor it to be safe. But in this video, I'm going to be diving into everything I could find about furries pertaining to psychology. However, all the information I found on this topic is very limited or non-existent, which made it pretty challenging, but I was able to find some interesting information. We will be covering the origins of furries and then asking important questions like is being a furry a f What is the personality makeup of furries? And what connections exist between furries and zoo f And finally the question, why are people furries? Now in case you haven't noticed, furries aren't a thing that have always existed. Like gays and straight people, you can go back in time and you'll find that they've pretty much always existed. But not furries. Furries first became a thing in the 1980s and they rose with comics and animation. This is extremely recent in history. I mean that's literally 40 years ago. This is an extremely new thing. We also imagine furries today as this person in a fur suit, but for most people, especially back then, it was literally just drawing human-like animals but with boobs. That's what it was. Fun fact, most furries only have tails. The typical furry you see on video with this whole fursuit mascot, only about 10 to 15% of furries actually have those because they're so expensive. But buying a little tail is not really expensive. But here is something interesting. A lot of interviews you watch from furries, where furries are asked questions, they all say, it isn't a fish, it isn't sexual which gives you the impression that they aren't into furries in a sexual way, right? Ron, I don't even know why they all say that, but all of their own studies on fur science say something completely different. 96% of male furries watch explicit material, while 78% of females did too. That is shocking because women aren't known for watching it. If you know anything about women, they are known for reading those types of things in books. They are not known for watching it. On top of that, when you compare these numbers to the average non-furry, both of those groups are significantly higher. They all watch it, and it gets even more insane. When it comes to their perception, if they view these things in a positive or negative light, explicit art of furries, it is generally seen in a neutral and positive way, except for women which is mainly seen as a neutral. So what's so strange about that? It's because these furries have extremely negative attitudes towards non-furry porn. What the heck? So maybe when they put on the fursuit and they identify as a furry, they don't feel as if it is a fish in the moment. But it is most definitely something they are attracted to in an explicit way. They are attracted to them. It is sexual. So I guess the question is, what do you mean by a fish? Do you mean that when you wear the costume in the moment, you're getting some sort of weird gratification out of it? Or are we talking about, do you watch explicit material of anthropomorphic creatures with big boobs? If the second one is a fish, then furryism is a fish. You can't get any way around it. Yes, it is. These people are lying to themselves. There is also even another survey done, 334 male furries. A large majority of the sample reported non-heterosexual identities at 84%. And as for some degree of sexual motivation for being a furry, 99% said yes. Literally out of 300 furries, no, there was no sexual motivation behind it, trust me. <laughs> like only three. They keep saying that they aren't into furries in some weird way. Trust me, being a furry is not sexual. And their argument is a lot of the enjoyment of being a furry is not sexual. A large percent of it has nothing to do with explicit images of furries. And they use that to claim it isn't a fish. Though the problem is when you look at the data, they all watch porn and explicit furry porn. Sure, not all furry drawings are explicit, but practically all of the furries watch explicit versions of them. That's like saying, trust me bro, I'm not gay. 90% of my interactions with other men are non-sexual. But it's like, oh wait a minute, what about that 10%? That 10% where you're both in bed. <laughs> You're gay! And it's the same with furries, it's a fetish! Now is anybody shocked by this? I don't think so. I think the only thing that caught us off guard
Vanguard was the fact that they're repulsed by normal explicit images and videos, but they are drawn towards furries. Not only are they into furries, but they're exclusively into furries, it seems. I'm sorry that I'm censoring all these words. I really don't want this video to be demonetized. I spent so much time working on this. Anyways, what about them as a group and their psychological makeup? Well, it seems that most of them are not straight. The survey we just covered said that 84% were not straight, while another survey done by Fur Science says that up to 25% are straight. That means 15 to 20 percent are straight. This shows atypical sexual behavior in their group as a whole. If the furry part wasn't enough for you, which is interesting because the personality traits homosexuals lean towards is higher amounts of openness, higher amounts of agreeableness, and higher amounts of neuroticism. While for furries, it's higher amounts of openness, obviously because of all the art they do, but higher amounts of extroversion and lower amounts of agreeableness. However, the agreeableness and neuroticism, they both puzzle me. A lot of the furries I've seen, they generally lean more feminine, which means higher neuroticism and agreeableness. In the statement they make, it's phrased in an interesting way. There is no statistical significant association of being a member of the furry community with stability and neuroticism. Now here's the thing, when you watch and listen to so many furries talk, especially on YouTube, you hear them repeat these things constantly. The furry community is open and they help one another with their struggles and differences. For example, there's a lot of autistic people in the furry community. I'm not making this up, there's a much higher percentage of autistic people compared to the standard population by five to 10 times the amount. This is very significant. Another thing is they also talk about how a furry suit makes them feel. The key word they use is comfort. People who have issues with mental health find particular comfort in the furry fandom. Like when I put my fur suit on, some part of me inside that I just can't express normally for whatever reason, whether it be fear of judgment or just my anxiety won't allow me because like, you know, I'm just, I'm a very timid person, but I'm also really extroverted. This is interesting to me. To me, it says that there is probably a higher amount of neuroticism and they're using all of this, the personas, the cosplay, envisioning themselves as this character, as a way of coping and dealing with the stress, to calm themselves, to make themselves feel more comfortable, especially given that they're in a community that accepts them for being different and welcomes them in and claims that they will help them with their struggles. I think this really would impact the neuroticism and it would draw in more people who struggle in that area, but use this to deal with it and calm themselves. Think of it, I'm pretty sure everybody can relate to this. Go back to Halloween when you're a kid. You dress up as Batman, you put on the costume for Halloween, and you feel different. You feel more energized. You can just do whatever you want. You feel much more freed. You feel much more comfortable. There's also even the fact that when you have this fursuit on, there's a physical divide, a physical barrier between you and the world. It's almost like you have your own power armor on. It's protecting you. All of this seems much more like a coping mechanism, a reaction, and a way of dealing with these struggles and problems. And looking at their stability, it probably is calming them. <laughs> Though it doesn't mean that it's the best solution, and I'm not saying that, but you gotta give the devil his due. However, we have to address the elephant in the room, being bestiality. They're also known as zoophiles. Now, what role does bestiality play in this? Does it play a role at all? Is there any connection between furries and zoophilia? In order to say if it does or does not, you have to understand some key aspects of it. One being individuals who are zoophiles, they're not exclusively attracted to animals. They're commonly drawn to both animals and people. You can see where this is going. That being, zoophiles are keen on furryism. Zoophiles are 5.45 times more likely to be a furry than the average person. Some of the personality characteristics of zoophiles are known for having higher amounts of neuroticism and have a really hard time socializing. Hence, not all zoophiles are quote unquote true zoophiles. 
whereas they're actually attracted and drawn to animals, but instead are more opportunistic about it and lack options. And you can commonly see this in prisons. In male prisons, homosexuality is extremely common. Reason being, there are no women there, and there are a lot of people who are in there for life. So either you can't do anything for the rest of your life, or you try being gay. They call it being gay for the stay. The same thing happens for many zoophiles. Yet their prison is that they have nobody in their lives. They're excluded from society. They're freaks. They don't have any options. Nobody wants to be with them, except for animals, which... Well, they can't do anything about it now, can they? Now for zoophiles as a whole, we can find one thing actually, higher amounts of prenatal testosterone, just like homosexuality and other non-heterosexual groups. Pretty much every non-heterosexual group out there has higher levels of prenatal testosterone exposure. So finding this information out about zoophiles is not shocking whatsoever. Though the problem is, what I talked about before being opportunistic behavior and lacking options, isn't reflected in all zoophiles. I have had the displeasure of having to really read up on these things. And let me tell you, they have their own quote-unquote community and even organizations advocating on their behalf, known as Zeta and Effa, or Equality for All. This is, it's so messed up. Some of the most creepiest, perverted, freakiest shit I've seen in my life. The sacrifices I make for this channel. Please hit that subscribe button. It took a lot of research for this video. Now, going back to furries, considering it is the norm to be anything but heterosexual, it would be a safe bet to say that all of them have higher levels of prenatal testosterone exposure. And for those who are confused on what I mean by prenatal testosterone exposure, feel free to check out my previous video where I talk about this being, why are people gay according to science? That will clear things up for you. And unfortunately, there are a lot of things I find eerily similar to furries and zoophiles when it comes to these numbers. When it comes to furries, they're both attracted to anthropomorphic characters and regular people. But this is just how it is for zoophiles too, but they're just more on the extreme end. It's the exact same thing. They're both attracted to animals and people, just like furries are attracted to people and anthropomorphic characters. It's kind of like that furry meme of, this is a regular person, and then it goes to furry, and then it goes to animal. That's a real thing. These jokes reveal truths about the communities. Now I'm not saying that all furries are zoophiles, no. But I'm saying, zoophiles are definitely furries. And when you take all of this information together, my current theory is on all of these things, on why they are all connected being non-heterosexual groups, autism, the furries, and a small portion of straight people, and zoophiles, is that they all stem from one thing, being prenatal testosterone. But the thing is, what decides where you land, whether you'll be a furry, whether you'll be a zoophile, whether you'll be gay, or all the rest, is your environment. Except for autism, I mean, that that's not environmental. The only thing you could really say with autistic people in the environment is, well, there are autistic furries, and there are autistic people who aren't furry. I mean, look at the furries, it's a very new thing, and I would say it is a fetish. It is defined as a fetish, and it's one that arrived very recently, within 40 years. It's almost like a distant new baby cousin of zoophilia. Now, I'm not saying it's on the same level as Zoophilia, don't get me wrong, but you cannot deny the connection. All of these things are intrinsically connected, but what decides it is indeed the environment. Now, as to what decides it according to the environment, I can try and talk about this a bit, but YouTube really wouldn't like me to talk about it all that much. But one thing you can look up is imprinting. I suggest you to research this a little bit by yourself. This video might get demonetized as is, but I don't want to get my whole channel in trouble for just talking about this. But if you were to imply imprinting, it would make a lot of sense with zoophiles and furries. And it would make sense for homosexuals, but that is to say that they had a young early childhood experience. I can't really talk about that. Who knows if that's just gonna get me demonetized right here and now, but it's a very likely possibility. And I'm not saying that this is the case for all people who are non-heterosexual, but it's possibly one out of many. But all I can say is, there is, I believe, a biological element to this. 
But there is without a doubt in my mind, given how there is so much variation with this biological elements being prenatal testosterone, that there is without a doubt a very strong force being the environment. Now as to what that environment is that creates these variations, that is up to debate and it probably isn't going to be a debate that ends up on my channel. It's going to be something you look into yourself. Please continue looking into these things, research these things yourself form your own opinions, feel free to disagree with me, I do not mind, these are simply my own opinions, and that is pretty much it. I really hope you enjoyed this video, and it was a very chaotic ride, and I'm, this video might get demonetized, but you know, that's such as life. I hope this gave you a new perspective on these things. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe, and if you have any ideas for future videos, feel free to just leave them down in the comments. Anyways, take care.